I'm Danielle Miles, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Nevada, Reno. My main research is on small mammals and non-game species at pinion and juniper removal sites. But for today's presentation, I'm going to talk about a pilot study where we're monitoring small mammals in northwestern Nevada, so the northwestern part of Washoe County. And this case study takes place during the winter at talus sites. This is an example of one of our areas where we were monitoring. Talus are the rocky scree that are associated with mountainsides. And so these habitats are long-term refugia or have thought to have been long-term refugia over millennia. Um, and so rocky habitats can provide thermal regulation between species um, from the environment as they can go deeper into the rocks and control that body temperature. <clears throat> but what we wanted to know is who, what species use this habitat during the winter and how? Do they remain active or are they using these habitats um, for hibernation? So for this pilot study, our main questions are what species continue to use the talus throughout the winter? And these species, which are then non-migratory species, do they remain active while they're there at the talus? And since it's hard to get to these habitats, they're rocky, they're far off roads, they're in really rural parts of the county, and it gets very snow packed. Um, one of the most effective ways that we can monitor these locations. So to give you an overview, again, we're in northern Washoe County, and you can see we have two main sites for this project. And so these regions have multiple locations that we're monitoring within them, but they're Macy Flat on the uh, northern side of the border of Sheldon National Antelope Refuge. And then Bittner Butte, we have monitoring stations that are both without the, with outside of the refuge and within the refuge. At each one of these sites, um, we, were cho we chose them because during the 2019 summer season, they had pika sign. And so the way that you survey for pika in the early fall, so August through October, is you can look for hay piles and fresh poop. And these are two pictures of hay piles that we put out um, cameras at. So cameras were facing directly towards where were hot spots of pika activity during the summer. And next to each one of these cameras, you can see in the front part of the picture here, that green box is actually an acoustic recorder. So it's an SM4 made by Wildlife Acoustics. And these record everything in the human hearing um, sound range. And it records for five minutes on and then 55 minutes off at the beginning of every hour so that you can get anything that's making noise at that time. And then for some of these, you can see that uh, we've put the acoustics a little bit further from the talus. The talus is still pointing, I mean, the camera is still pointing straight into the talus towards the hay pile, but the tripod itself on the very top of this one has an additional high frequency microphone. So Wildlife Acoustics also makes a bat detector, and these are running from seven at night to seven in the morning, and they only record when they're triggered by a high frequency sound, and they make a four second recording that you can then use to identify the bat species. So of our nine detector stations that we have out, we have four with cameras, all nine have acoustics for the pica that are there, and then six of these have bat detectors. So to start off, we can do a, a game of find the pica. In this picture here, you can see in December, the pica is in the corner. I've circled it. You can see that the snowpack builds. This is a little bit later in the season and the pica is there again by the rock. At another one of our sites, um, you can see that it reemerged in April. So we were able to see that the, the snow was melting and then this pica carrying a little stick is right there in the corner. The hay pile is further back in the middle of this picture and you can see it there. So we've seen a lot of activity both through the winter and once the snowpack melted of uh, the animals, both pika and others, moving towards that hay pile. And now if you look closely, he's back there. So these pika are using the habitat and we're able to still monitor them with the cameras throughout the winter. Some of the things that we noticed is that these two different regions had very different trends of snowpack. So the Macy Flat site, the more northern site, they had snow from mid-November all the way into the first week of April. Then come that first week of April, there was a day or two where all the snow was melted. There was one more day where the snow had accumulated and it melted again and never returned. 
However, at Bittner Butte, um, we see that the snow melted and returned 11 times throughout the monitoring season. And so this actually shows a few different trends with the pika activity. The Macy's Flat, where there was more snowpack, we saw pika all the way until uh, December 23rd. But then when um, that, the deepest temperatures happened and the deepest snowpack, we didn't see the pika. One emerged on February 1st, and then they were never seen again at that site. However, at the Bittner Butte site, where you had snow melting and then repacking melting again, um, they were inactive from December 2nd through March 10th. Um, and then after that first day of testing the weather, they went back into hiding, and we saw them every day again um, from March 29th through when we picked up that monitoring station, that camera, and that tripod. And so uh, we see here that they have a different activity pattern than the Mason's flat pika that might not have made it past the winter. Um, and something that we did see, so these are considered to be, this American pika, and they're considered to be diurnal species. But we noticed that most of their activity was actually during the nighttime. So they have more of a nocturnal um, activity pattern than we had expected. Another thing we had expected was to hear more vocalizations at the time that the pika were out and active. But um, we didn't really hear any vocalizing or anything distinct um, in terms of pika. And so a trend that we've been noticing across the region is that as the pika are becoming less dense and the populations are declining, they're vocalizing less. And this is, we think that this is potentially related to um, the fact that they're not in a group, so they're not alarm calling for another individual to warn them of a predator or tell them that they're at the site. Other species that we got on the camera during this winter pilot study um, were the chip, leaf chipmunk, um, some rabbits, and a few dark-eyed juncos, which you can see in the pictures here. And this is in addition to predators. Um, so we see a bobcat here. And then if you play find the animal again in the right picture, you can find that there is actually a weasel running by. And so this is that same area where the pika um, was carrying the stick away from the hay pile. And we see there's the hay pile back there. And a lot of act our activity come the early spring um, is around this uh, hay pile, even if it's not the pike itself. This weasel we see on multiple days running through the hay pile back into the right hand side of the picture where the pike emerges um, and back and forth. Some predators, though, that we didn't see at the actual sites moving around. Um, were coyotes. So there's um, coyotes and predator birds that we hear on the acoustic recordings that aren't actually walking directly in front of the camera traps. So if we compare these methods for looking at what species are using the talus during the winter, the camera traps, the batteries last longer. Um, so you can leave them on uh, where they're only taking a picture when it's triggered. Unlike the acoustic recordings, because they take in every sound that's at the human hearing range, they always need to be recording. Um, it's not triggered by any one sound or wind would tr trigger it all the time. So in order to get the batteries to last throughout the winter, we need them on a five minute, 55 minute off schedule, which really misses then a large portion of potential activity. However, with the acoustic recordings, you also get songbirds. So all of the um, birds who are roosting elsewhere, but not walking in front of the cameras directly, you can identify. Um, the weather conditions in terms of wind or rain, you can hear on this uh, acoustic recordings, where with the camera traps, you can measure the snow depth or get some measure of uh, how fast the snow accumulates and melts. Um, in addition to the weather conditions and the acoustic recordings, we've also picked up a lot of anthropogenic noise. So if you hear an ATV or a plane going by, um, you're able to record that as a measure too, as uh, anthropogenic noise is being identified more and more as affecting animal behavior. So to uh, be able to take all of those things from the acoustic recordings, though, you need to pay someone or have a volunteer, um, and their skill level is going to be dependent on how quick they go through those files in terms of identifying pika, and if you want more than just a metric of songbird presence, or predator bird presence, you need to have someone skilled who's able to identify those birds just by their sounds. Where the camera traps um, is more of a sexy project and you can get an undergrad or someone 
um, pretty willingly to go through pictures and the camera traps themselves are about half the cost of acoustic recordings. So there's less skill needed to go through the camera trap, um, which continues to lower the cost compared to acoustic recording. However, I feel that you can't just use one or the other for these talisites because of the complex um, interactions between animals that you see. You would be excluding some over the others if you chose one method and not the other. So pairing the camera traps and the acoustic recordings together got us a much better um, and accurate picture of what animals are using the talus during the winter. Here's an example of a coyote sound file on the very bottom here. You can see that that's time on the x-axis and then it's kilohertz on the y-axis and this is from one of our summer recordings of coyotes where you get loud packs near the detectors um, for the winter um, the coyotes didn't seem to actually be directly at the telesites because the sound is a little less strong and you hear more yips um, so the coyotes are a little bit further away from the um, tripods themselves but we're working on a side project now and you'll see there's an undergrad um, Claudia, who is giving a poster at this conference, who will be talking more about how we are using tripods to triangulate where coyotes are and measure them um, in terms of their distance by sound. So we'd be able to see more in the future where the coyotes are in relation to the talus. So for the six detectors that we had um, at the, the talus sites that were able to detect high frequency sound for bat acoustics. Um, we, those, this region is an area that we monitor during the summer. And so we know that during the summer, there's 15 species of bat present around these sites, even if they're not directly at the talus or in surrounding woodlands or sagebrush. But for the winter, seven of these 15 present species were still present. I still need to manually vet these sound files for some of the harder to detect species like Townsend big ear bats. So there's potentially 10 of these 15 species based off of my first look through the data manually. But using Sonobat for auto detection, we were able to determine that there's seven of 15 species still present. And so if we compare these two regions, um, so Macy being the northern one um, to the northwest of the Sheldon National Animal Refuge and then Bittner Butte within Sheldon, um, we had a lot more activity at the Macy flat site. And this is interesting because that talus patch is much larger and also extends much higher um, and has tree stands near it, um, much larger junipers um, surrounding that area. So there's potential roosts both in the talus and in the trees um, that these bats are being recorded from. And then the Sheldon sites um, are Bittner Butte, but the two Bittner Butte sites outside of the refuge didn't have bat detectors. So I'm using Macy and Sheldon here. At each one of these sites, there was three tripods that was recording bats. Um, and something that's interesting to point out is that there was actually very few bats detected on two of the tripods within Sheldon. Where across Macy, um, you do see that there was bats both identifiable and unidentifiable at all three of the tripods. Um, the most common bat seen at all of these is the Brazilian free tail bat, that dark pink on the bottom. But we'll be able to look at further um, when I do a little more analysis and see what characteristics of the talus in the site might predict which species are roosting there or using that habitat during the winter. To look a little deeper into the Sheldon sites, this is where we had the tripods set up and they're relatively close together. Um, and so this is a little bit old of a Google Maps image, but you can see on the bottom right side of this um, picture, there's trees standing, but actually this we, is one of our uh, long-term monitoring stations because there's been a pinion and juniper um, cut here, or a juniper cut here, and so all of these trees are actually on the ground that are on this um, bottom right-hand side of the image, where they are still standing closer to that D tripod on the left, and so we see that even though these tripods are pretty close together, um, that they have uh, slightly different temperature makeups. And so I was using um, the temperatures that the S74 full spectrum bat detectors record when they make a, a when they record each bat uh, file at 5.30 a.m. because the recorders during the early part of the evening when they're recording the bat detectors have been in the, sun, the bat activity. They've been in the sun all day. 
Um, so they're a little bit warmer than the actual ambient temperature. Where during the middle of the evening, um, before the sun starts to rise, they're closer to the ambient air temperature. And if we look at these um, fluctuations between days um, for the uh, sound files at both D and then H and I, um, even though there's more data from the D tripod because it's taking more temperatures to more of activity there at bat activity there is, um, the trends are still relatively the same. So it's interesting that maybe temperature is not the predictor here, um, but we will look into that more and compare it to the size of the talus and the amount of tree cover that there is currently. And so the last point that I want to make is that this is a complex issue and that we do see that there are species that are thought to migrate far, um, like some of these bat species that are staying in northern um, Nevada during the winter that we didn't otherwise know were there. And there's still a lot more questions to be answered about the pica activity and what allows for these pica to maintain themselves in these populations as many of these populations continue to decline. So thank you for coming to my talk. And if you have more questions, you can reach out to me. Um, I have a website, Danielle C. Miles, and I would like to thank all of our funders and collaborators for helping me with this project. Thanks.